Greetings and welcome to the Overcoming Overfishing session at this year's Economist World Ocean Summit. My name is Andrew Hudson. I'm the head of the Water and Ocean Governance Program at the United Nations Development Program, and I'm very pleased to be moderating today's session. By now, most people have heard the key figures that describe the state of the global fishing sector. Over 3 billion people rely on fish for 20% of their daily protein needs. Some 60 million people depend on fishing or aquaculture for their jobs and livelihoods. 38% of fish caught or farmed worldwide are traded internationally. But according to FAO, globally some 35% of fish stocks are considered overfished. Some 20% of the world's fish catch is illegal, unreported, or unregulated. Governments dish out some $20 billion a year in harmful fishery subsidies. As a result, global wild fish catch has been basically stagnant at about 110 million tons per year for, last, for, for the last 30 or more years. So to discuss this immense challenge of sustaining the world's fisheries, we're very fortunate to have a distinguished panel that cuts across several key elements of the sector. Representing one of the world's largest buyers and retailers of seafood products, please welcome Jane Ewing, Senior Vice President for Sustainability at Walmart. Next, from Ocean Choice International, a vertically integrated seafood company based in Canada, please welcome Carrie Bonnell, Vice President for Sustainability and Engagement. Next, please welcome Maria Damanaki. Maria is former European Commissioner for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, served as the Global Managing Director for Oceans at the Nature Conservancy, and is now an international advisor at the Paradise International Foundation. And please welcome Rupert Howes. Rupert is the CEO of the Marine Stewardship Council, the world's leading fisheries certification and eco-labeling organization. So diving right in, starting Maria with you. Uh, as the former EU Commissioner for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, can you share some of your experience with the EU's effort to sustain its fisheries? Tell us a bit about what worked, what didn't, and some basic lessons from the EU that could be transferred to other regions. And then, in addition, what areas does the EU still need to take action on sustaining its fisheries? Thank you very much, Andrew. First, I would like to say that I was really very, very lucky because I served as a Marine Commissioner, European Commissioner, during the time when we had to introduce a new fisheries policy. So I had this authorization to introduce this new fisheries policy that is now implemented. It has been implemented for more than 10 years now. And I can say it was a success up to a point because now we have uh, more stocks managed in a more sustainable way. When I took office, we had uh, three or four. Now we have more than 30, so it was a success. Uh, also, we have uh, better seafood for our consumers in Europe. We have more certified food uh, through certification systems. We have uh, more transparency in the supply chain. And also, we have uh, stopped imports from illegal fishing, almost stopped them. So, the situation is better in a nutshell. So, we had this success because uh, the new fisheries policy, the current fisheries policy, is based in three principles. And it was a radical change at that time. First, we followed uh, the ecosystems approach and uh, a policy based on science. So we have changed the management, the way we manage the fisheries. And uh, this brought some food immediately. The second point, the second principle is that we have realized that we cannot do that alone as legislators or as our authorities, public authorities. So we have engaged the private sector, the markets itself. And by markets, I don't mean only the fisheries industry, I mean also uh, retailers, uh, processors, even the consumers themselves through their choices and demands. So uh, this ended up with multiplying effort that we have tried to start. And the third point is that uh, we have enhanced international cooperation. So it was not just about European workers, it was about fisheries worldwide. And uh, we have uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with USA, with Japan. We have started dialogue with China, with Russia, with other countries in the Pacific. So at the end of the day, what we have done is uh, that we were able uh, to uh, improve the situation of, fish of fisheries as a whole. 
So these were some successes. On the other hand, uh, we have a lot of difficulties and there are some issues that I have to underline right now. First, we were not, uh, how can I say, we were not very successful, completely successful about control and implementation of our policy. For example, we have a, a lot of novelties like stop dropping fish back to the sea, stop at all. We have uh, some ideas about eliminating the fishery subsidies. We have stopped all the fishery subsidies. I'm very proud about that from the European financial instruments, but the member states are still going on with fisheries. About control, we were more successful in the Northern Europe, but we were not so successful in the Mediterranean. We have thousands of small scale vessels. It's very difficult to control. And though in the Mediterranean, we are able to uh, save some emblematic species like bluefin tuna and sharks, we were not very successful in the small fish and other species. And then what I can send at the end, what I can say at the end of the day is that through our system to stop imports from illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, uh, we have changed a little bit the whole game because it was the first time that the European Union has posed trade measures against illegal, illegal products. And I have seen that from my experience. I can mention one very, very important country, one of the biggest exports in the world. In one night, they have changed their policy just because they realized that we were ready to stop the, uh, all the imports in the European Union. So to make a long, a long story short, sustainability pays back, and this is something that we have to remember. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Maria. So Jane, Maria mentioned, of course, the importance of the consumer and, and sustainable seafood supply chains in the European Union's approach and some of its successes. Walmart, as a, course, as a company, of course, has taken a leadership position in embedding sustainability into its seafood procurement requirements for many years now. And in 2020, you made a bold commitment to pursue becoming a regenerative company. How, what does that mean in practice and how does it relate to issues such as overfishing? Yes, thank you, Andrew, for the question. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this really important discussion. Um, here at Walmart, we've been working on sustainability for a long time. Um, we've, over that time, we've continued to evolve our approach to building a culture that prioritizes creating shared value for all stakeholders. And that includes the environment and it includes how we work with our buyers and our suppliers on sustainable sourcing efforts. So the commitment you mentioned, um, Andrew, it was such an important step for us. And what regeneration means to us is evolving our practices to restore, renew and replenish the planet in addition to conserving. And it means adopting regenerative practices in things like agriculture, and forests and, and fisheries, whilst advancing prosperity and equity for customers and associates and people who, who participate in the product supply chain. So we know it's a very lofty goal. There's a lot of work to do. Um, as part of that commitment, we, we, made a, 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 we set a goal to help protect, manage or restore at least 50 million acres of land and a million square miles of ocean by 2030. And that's in partnership with the Walmart Foundation. And there are several components to that. Obviously a critical one is sustainable sourcing. And as that relates to issues like overfishing, uh, we aim to improve how products are sourced. We work hard to promote nature friendly policies, use certifications um, and continue to support preservation efforts as well as invest in place-based partnerships that combine this idea of, of conservation, restoration, and sustainable management. And one, one particular example I'm really proud of is our partnership with the Nature Conservancy and the Republic of the Marshall Islands that launched last year. And the goal is to sustainably source tuna for our private brand uh, products. And while doing so, support the Pacific Island communities. So what it means is the way it, the way it's set up, a significant portion of the profits will be directed back into the Pacific Island communities that they can in, then invest in key initiatives to continue to build that positive ecosystem. So the idea is 
um, really to drive industry leading environmental labor and traceability standards and really hold the bar high um, for the industry and showcase how it's possible to do the right thing to benefit all people in the, in the chain, including the community. Um, it's one it's one test, Andrew. It's it's early days, but we're very very optimistic that it's the right the right direction to go in. And I just quickly add two more things. Um, certifications is very important. We ask our suppliers to validate that our tuna is being sourced to specific certification standards. And then in partnership with our with our foundation. Um, we, we, we invest in continuous improvement. So things like investing in greater transparency using technology with the Global Fishing Watch. We've got investments with Conservation International uh, to develop more approaches for tuna in the Pacific Ocean. So it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, but we feel optimistic there are, are tools that we can um, really make a difference here. Thank you, Jane. I, I very much welcome the the fact that Walmart is not just taking a single sector approach, fisheries, whether it's forestry, but an ecosystem approach, preserving ecosystems, which is, we know is a very important part of the approach. So Carrie, similar question for you. What are the key steps that Ocean Choice has made toward ensuring the sustainability of the seafood products that it has on offer? Thanks, Andrew. I think maybe first and foremost, if we have a VP position created within the company. The position I hold was created nearly a decade ago now, and it tells you the focus and priority that Ocean Choice has played to have a senior management position within its uh, within its uh, core business operation that have had for quite quite time. Uh, I can say from a sustainability, we've been a I would say an early adopter of the sustainable fisheries movement um, and sustainability certification movement. About ninety percent of the seafood that we uh, produce. Uh, are either MSC certified or in a robust fishery improvement program. I think the first fishery certified in Canada, Rupert and I were chatting about this a while ago, first uh, fishery certified to the Marine Stewardship Council standard in Canada was Northern Shrimp. We were a core part of that back in 2007. Um, one of the fisheries that we're most proud of is our yellowtail flounder fishery, which is a, a stock that collapsed during, I guess, the historic and iconic collapse of the Grand Bank in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, we just went the certification um, uh, of, of that into the third uh, round of certification on that particular stock that was initially certified back in 2010. And it's a great example of rebound and rebuild that stock is now managed well. well MI. We have a robust fishery and very well. So, uh, so that's, that's been a real positive trend. Um, we have a number of fisheries that are not yet ready for certification, and that's where the fishery improvement programs are so sort of so important to us. Fisheries that are coming out of moratorium, I could use an example like redfish. We have a huge pulse of redfish in the, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence right now, about 4 million metric tons uh, through three sort of super year classes that have come through. We three years ago saw this coming. We, we put together a, a very robust fishery improvement project through fisheryprogress.org. And our intentions over the next couple of years is to evolve that into uh, an MSC certified fishery. And there are other examples I could cite, but in the interest of time, I, I, I certainly won't at this point. But it's been a core focus of our business. One or two more examples probably I'd cite. One of the things that I think we are most proud of as a company, uh, nearly five years ago now, we invested in an industrial research chair in fish stock assessment and sustainable harvest advice for Northwest Atlantic Fisheries with the Marine Institute of Memorial University of Newfoundland. We provided some seed funding uh, to get that initiative started. We, uh, we brought in a scientist, a partner with a scientist, Dr. Noel Cadigan, who was uh, working with the government of Canada at the time. That chair has now grown from uh, Dr. Cadigan to two junior chairs, uh, a host of graduate students, postdocs that have come into the program, focused on new approaches to stock assessment, focused on adapting to climate change and ensuring uh, that we have the mo most robust assessments in place, working closely with government regulators to ensure that the models that they're developing and the work that they're doing is going to lead to uh, ad be adopted into policy. And, uh, and I think that that's something we're, we're quite pleased with. And the fact that there's uh, the university actually developed a graduate program in fish stock assessment at the master's and PhD level research based, the first two graduate programs at that institute focused on fisheries uh, you're building future critical capacity. And uh, these students are going on now to work in public agencies, working with NGOs, uh, working with industry. So I, I think it's a legacy piece that, that we're really proud of and have been a, a core part of. Um, we, we invest in fishery science and stock assessment generally with, uh, with government as well, which I think is important. Talk more about that later. 
maybe the last point I'll, I'll mention is not just on fishery sustainability, but just to, you know the the, uh, the 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 overall sort of um, um, environmental movement. Um, we uh, we just went through the process of fleet remo renewal with one of our vessels. Uh, as our vessels age, we're looking at new and and and, uh, and improved designs. Uh, the new vessel that came into the fleet back in 2020, the MV Calvert, uh, has a green class designation, a low carbon footprint. Uh, the efficiencies that we designed in that vessel will result in us saving up to 2.8 million kilowatt hours of energy per year, over 500 metric tons of fuel per year. So we're not just looking at this solely from a fishery sustainability standpoint, it's the broader climate movement as well and measures that we're taking. And you know, there's no there's no end line in this, it's a continuous process and, and we'll continue to strive for, uh, for improvement and advancement and sustainability in the years to come. Thank you very much, Karen. It's very welcome to hear about bringing state-of-the-art science into fisheries management, bringing um, investment in, in research, and of course, incorporating the clear impacts of climate change on fisheries into the management. Um, so shifting now, we've heard several mentions already of, of certification of fisheries. So we're fortunate to have the, the senior guru of the field here, Rupert. Um, certification of fisheries has emerged as an indispensable tool to move the sector towards sustainability. At the same time, my understanding about present, at present only around 17% of global fish yields are certified. So as a global leader in this approach at MSC, what does MSC see as the key barriers to be overcome to continue scaling up of certification, particularly in developing countries? And how does MSC plan to overcome such barriers, say in the next 10 to 20 years? Andrew, thank you. There's an awful lot wrapped up in that question. Uh, firstly, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I passionately believe market-based programs are part of the solution to addressing the global challenge of overfishing. Um, consumers really do care. Our, our 25 years of experience at MSC demonstrates that if you empower consumers, if you give them the information they need, they will make the best environmental choice. Those choices in turn reward those fishers who are doing the right thing and managing our oceans sustainably. But critically, and I think this is the lessons of sort of operating for two and a half decades, the more the market demands credible, traceable, sustainable seafood choices, the leadership of OCI, Walmart, other retailers around the world, that builds a momentum. That draws more fisheries into this third party, transparent, stakeholder engaged process where many of them have to make improvements to the way they fish the oceans. And ultimately, that's what it's all about, delivering real change and lasting change uh, in the oceans. 17% um, is hard won. Um, it's been quite a journey. But when I look at MSC now, we, we, we have that 17%, about 12 million metric tons of seafood, uh, 500 uh, fisheries around the world, and a market now worth about $15 billion annually. And that is the driver that's bringing more fisheries in. Stepping up, though, obstacles to scaling. Um, really, the most profound obstacle is global climate change. And we all know that. I mean, it, it, it's, its impact is already very apparent. Uh, it's impacting on fishery reproductive health, migration patterns. Um, and as a consequence, um, we're already losing MSC certifications. I think, again, at that high level, increased nationalism isn't helping. And I do think, despite some signs of optimism, there's, there's a lack of political leadership and at least that sense of urgency to create the right enabling policy environment uh, that enables fisheries to become certified and sustainable. So um, whilst we want to scale, and I believe it's part of what's needed, um, if anything, we're going to face contraction. Uh, we've lost 2 million tonnes of certified fisheries in the Northeast Atlantic, in part because of global climate change, and partly because nation states are setting uh, unilaterally set quotas that exceed um, scientific advice. We're likely to see the loss of tuna fisheries in the Western Central Pacific, uh, again, because of the failure to adopt harvest control rules and harvest strategies, which are a cornerstone of the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fishing, and, and hence the MSC standard. So we need robust management. Um, what's MSC doing about this? Uh, we're engaging more uh, in the Global South, low-income countries. We've set a very ambitious target to engage with a third of landings by 2030, as our contribution through the leadership of our partners to deliver the SDGs. Um, we're engaging, not surprisingly from what I've said, in a little bit more of the uh, quiet public policy advocacy. 
Uh, and we're also hoping to mobilise resources to help fisheries on their pathway towards sustainability. And I hope there might be time for me to tell you a little bit more about that later. All right. Thank you very much, Rupert. Now, let's now go to what could say is a $64,000 question. Let's look about financing. How are we going to finance the cost of sustainable fishing, the cost of certification, the cost of robust uh, fisheries management? They can be out of reach for some fisheries and in particular for many, for many governments, particularly in developing countries and some of the regional fisheries management organizations, the RFMO. So, on top of this, we know these supply chains, they're long, they're complex, involve multiple actors from the fishermen all the way to the supermarket, each of whom have to you know, enjoy some kind of financial benefit. So this is a question for each of you, about two minutes each. In your view, how is the best, what is the best way for the overall costs of delivering truly sustainable seafood to consumers be secured from this diverse suite of supply chain actors? So starting uh, with you, Jane. Right, thank you. Um, I, I, I would say, first of all, we do believe certifications are critically important. And we've actually set a goal that by 2025, all of our canned tuna will be sourced from fisheries that are either certified as sustainable, working towards that certification, or engaged in a fishery improvement project. But we know we have a role to play in helping them on that journey, as you as you said, Rupert, customers expect it, but no single group can can drive it on our own. And I think the Pacific Island tuna example I just mentioned is a great example of how we're working on the issue. It is a new model; it's a regenerative model. We're testing, we're learning, but this idea of putting um, the profits back in towards the sourcing community so that it can build resilience, it can build the right tools and techniques to ensure that they are sustainable. The other thing it does, it, it also shortens the supply chain, so it, it mitigates some of the complexity and risk and, and adopts this almost like an MSC plus approach, but while still maintaining an accessible price to the end consumer, because that's, you know, as a retailer, that's critical. We, we have to provide a, affordable products to our customers. Um, so it is just one example. Uh, we'll, we'll be working to keep pulling multiple levers in how we can build these sustainable supply chains across the whole um, of aquaculture, but it, it does mean, you know, looking very hard at our direct sourcing, thinking about these these ecosystem place-based approaches. Um, and, and you mentioned it, Rupert, the, the, the regulatory environment is so critical. We need, you know, good work on, on policy. You know, no single player can do it on our own. And then leveraging philanthropy where it makes sense to, to actually go, you know, to the source of the issue and, and try and improve some of the some of the, 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 the hard to, to crack issues like monitoring and transparency and so on. So yeah, I could go on and on, but I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for everybody to speak. Right, thank you. And, and so Maria, the same question, what are, what are some of the models or examples you can see for the cost recovery equation of sustainable fishing? Thank you, Adi, but let me clarify something first. I would like to underline that if we are going to have a good policy in long term, the nature is going to pay us back. So in long term, the stocks will be enough there. They will be big, the fish is getting bigger and we can fish less and earn more. So at the, in long term, we will, the fisheries will be profitable and everything will be settled by mother nature. But we have to find money for the transitional period. This is exactly the point. And the only way, not the best way, the only way to do that is to share the cost. We need partnerships. Nobody can have the full cost. We need partnerships, public, public private, between the public authorities, the supply chain, the retailers, the producers, the consumers, everybody. And there are innovative and smart tools we can use. I have a personal experience with the Nature Conservancy, we have done this debt swap and World Bank and J.B. Morgan in Seychelles. So the government has signed and now they have created the second big marine protected area in the Indian Ocean. And at the same time, they have better fisheries. So it can be done. Also, there are other new ideas like blue bonds, fisheries bonds. We can use all that. But the idea, Andy, to repeat it, is to find a way to put there the money for the transitional period so we can benefit from from the profits of the good situation of the stocks later. 
Thank you, Maria. And, and uh, Carrie, the same question. Yeah, I think, Andrew, I mean, there are a number of cost, cost points on the road to sustainable fisheries. And you could look at this, I mean, from the developed world standpoint and from, the, from a developing world standpoint, from a Canadian perspective, as an example, I mean, we, would, we look at our federal regulator, in, in our case, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, as playing a key role in the fishery science portion of, of that. Uh, we employ about 90,000 Canadians in the fish and seafood sector, about $9 billion contribution uh, to GDP. There's a public role, obviously, in fishery science and maintaining robust science programs, stock assessments, and, and, and so on. Uh, I think that's critical. Uh, Maria was actually, I think Maria was part of the high-level panel on, on sustainable ocean economy. I continuously cite uh, uh, something from that uh, when it speaks to the fact that every dollar invested in increasing production of sustainable, sustainably sourced ocean protein is estimated to yield ten dollars in benefits I, I use that quite a bit because i think it's a really really important point on the certification side like for us we bear the cost industry can bear the cost of certification that's both both in achieving certification and addressing conditions of certification we look at partnerships and collaborations where possible but i think generally speaking we, we can bear that cost the challenge obviously and i'm not the best person to speak to this or others on the panel is is how you deal with the challenge in the developing world where i think still half of the world's fisheries are data poor, data absent. You know, I started my career 24 years ago. Uh, my second favorite island on the world after the rock where I live right now is Palawan in the Philippines. I started my career as an intern in the Philippines and going from, from Newfoundland and Labrador, going from Canada to the Philippines and seeing the lack of data, the lack of governance, the lack of structure, uh, you know, working working uh, with, with harvesters, trying to set up coastal resource management programs, community-based programs to put some level of governance in place uh, to for food security purposes in that case. There are so many challenges that need to be addressed and the investment levels, I mean, re, I mean, Jane Jane spoke to, to retailer investment, there's philanthropic investment, Rupert has talked to, you know, role for the MSC. Data is so critical and management is so critical in, in the case of developing world fisheries. And I think that's where a significant amount of energy obviously needs to be focused from a financing standpoint. Standpoint. Thank you, Gary. And uh, Rupert, the, the same question. Where to begin? Um, yes, sustainable fisheries management costs money. You need science, you need data, you need sophisticated stock assessments. But building on what Maria said, um, I, I think the cost of inaction is far, far greater. And if we get this right, nature will repay us. Um, Andrew, in your opening remarks, you talked about the 60 million direct livelihoods involved in this last amazing global industry harvesting a wild resource for food. Um, I've read figures that talk about 10% of the global workforce somehow being sustained by uh, global fishing industry. Um, and you've talked about hundreds of millions depending on this vital protein source, uh, uh, you know, for, for their main source of animal protein. So if we don't do this, we run the risk of destroying those livelihoods. We run the risk of accelerating overfishing and not overcoming it. And therefore, it comes back down to political leadership and management. We've simply got to do this. And, you know, I think we can start off with uh, getting the WTO to conclude their two year, sorry, two decade negotiations on ending harmful subsidies. Let's get that done. I think we need to get governments around the world that haven't ratified the port state measures to do that, to uh, close down the market for unsustainable seafood, for IUU, that is competing unfairly with those fisheries that have made the investment in demonstrating their sustainability you know, through the MSC program. Um, ultimately, though, because you're asking about costs and who bears them, I, I believe ultimately when all of that's done, uh, the price of seafood will probably have to go up. Uh, when, when those externalities have been internalized and we have sustainable fisheries management globally, we need to pay a true price for this wonderful renewable low carbon protein source. And ultimately that, that will be the consumer that bears that. Um, if time permits, I'd like to make one comment on, on the cost of certification. Um, there are real costs in, involved in certification, but again, drawing on our two decades plus of experience, um, pretty much every fishery that has achieved certification has come back to be recertified. Some fisheries are on their fourth five-year certification cycle. So I think it's really important to bear those costs and compare them to the benefits, which can include you know, access to uh, new markets, it can include preference in existing markets for some fisheries. And interestingly, often the small-scale fisheries, there can be a price premium. And there certainly can also be improved relationships with communities uh, and, and regulators. So the costs per kilo of fish of certification are actually quite low. The real costs come in from 
delivering the action plans that many fisheries have attached to their certifications, uh, which, which require significant investments, often by management agencies. So back to government. Thank you, Rupert. It's yeah, very reassuring to hear from everyone that the basic concept that the same we want to internalize the cost of pollution, internalize that externality into various polluting sources, we want to internalize the externality of overfishing into the co into these, providing that the private sector covers these costs. And of course, if necessary, they're passed on to the consumer as is, as is appropriate with, with, with such things. So I think uh, Carrie mentioned the um, the uh, high level panel and Maria, you co-chaired the advisory network of the high level panel on a sustainable ocean economy. Not surprisingly, one of the focus areas of the 17 volumes that the panel produced was fisheries. So can you share with us just briefly a couple of minutes, some of the most salient recommendations of that ocean panel related to moving global fisheries towards sustainability? And you know, where do you already see progress and where did the panel identify the kind of key gaps where more action is needed? Well, first I would like to underline what Rupert has already said, that climate change is there as a threat. It has changed a lot and is going to change more. Because to be honest, our answer to climate change, humanity's answer is not as good as it needs, is really needed. So climate change is there as a threat and a challenge, uh, but also uh, I would like to focus uh, from my experience in high level panel just on three points. The first was already underlined. It was already underlined by all of you, and it is uh, how important the good policy decisions are. We need good policy decisions. We need uh, we, we need leaders, political leadership, willing to make changes, to take the right decisions. This is the first. And this is something very, very important, especially from the global south, the developing world, where there are great, great challenges and they have to be faced correctly. So we need better management, we need better international cooperation, we need a special focus to RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations, in a way that can give fruit. The second point is uh, we have to take care and we have to need uh, we have to use all the technology and innovation that we now can use. Jane mentioned before the Global Fishing Watch, we have satellites, and I'm very proud to be to work with them. They, we have satellites, satellites, we can see everything. We can control much more easily what is happening in the sea. We have electronic monitoring. We can use electronic monitoring on the vessels so we can avoid observers. So there are new ideas. A lot is happening and we have to be innovative and find the smart solutions for all the challenges. Uh, and this can bring more transparency and transparency is very, very important for the fish, fishery supply chain. Then we need um, to create, to work for shifts in the consumers behavior, in their demands. Uh, we have to, en to encourage them, uh, perhaps ask for more, uh, for other species, not only the usual species, species that are less fished. And of course, we have to encourage aquaculture. Aquaculture is very, very important, especially the restorative aquaculture, the aquaculture of mussels and seaweed. It's a food uh, very, very rich in proteins, uh, these mussels, and bivalves, and seaweed. And at the same time, they can provide uh, the best food in a low cost, and also they can store the water quality. Uh, one last point referring to consumer demands and uh, behavior. I think that certification, it is already said, is very, very important. And uh, as Rupert said, and I can see that as a member of the board of MSC, we have a lot to do in order to spread this message, not only in Europe, in uh, America, in, uh, how can I say, the Western world, the developed world, but also in the developed world. And a lot to do, obviously. But the high level panel is continuing its work. Now France is going to join, and I'm very happy that more is to come. Thank you, Maria, very much. Uh, now, Carrie, um, 
a sizable fraction of the global wild fish catch, in fact, around half, is caught by small scale versus industrial fishers. Uh, SDG 14b specifically calls upon increasing the access of small scale fishers to both the resources and to markets. And it's widely known that small scale fishers are often disadvantaged in such access due to factors such as a lack of government policy uh, on small scale fishers. So I understand, for example, that Ocean Choice sources about half of its seafood from independent uh, Canadian fishermen. So can you provide us with some background? You know, how is this achieved? Was it more of a government driven uh, action or did Ocean Choice make a conscious decision to source seafood from the small scale sector or did both factors come into play? Yeah, good question, uh, Andrew. It's, it's really a little bit of both. Um, I mean, we we source about, uh, we produce about 80 million pounds of seafood annually and, and about 50% uh, of that will be through our vertically integrated business uh, and, and the other 50% will be seafood that we source from about 1,900 independent fishermen in the region. Now, these independent fish, fishermen could be operating vessels anywhere from probably 10 to 30 meters uh, in length. Some could be very small scale artisanal. Some could be larger vessels that operate at, at great distance. Uh, from a policy standpoint, you know, uh, we have fisheries in Canada that are primarily offshore fisheries, and we have fisheries in Canada that are primarily inshore fisheries or a mix of both. And, and there's been a government policy really to focus on that balanced fishery standpoint. As a company, uh, our greatest diversification is that balanced approach in terms of our own business lines, as well as uh, seafood that we can source uh, from, from independent harvesters. Uh, we are a family run business. Uh, our company started as a family run business, self-made company, and, and it's operated that way uh, for, for two decades now. And so uh, family run business, working with family, family run independent operators, uh, we have the structure and scale, so much of the product that, would, that we would source from these fishermen would go through our land-based processing operations. Uh, and we have our own global sales and marketing and distribution network. So we have the tools basically to provide fair market value and, and good pricing uh, to fishermen uh, in the province, in the region. And uh, we have the scale to get their product to market. And uh, it's a win-win scenario. It's mutually beneficial for, for, all, uh, for all participants. So it's, uh, it's sort of second nature to us, I, I guess, Andrew. We never really thought about it in the global context a great deal, but it is something we are quite uh, proud of. It's a relationship that we've had for quite some time and it's, it's only grown uh, in recent years years. And having that mix of inshore and offshore production, you, you have certain businesses that are highly seasonal in terms of some inshore operations. And if you mix the seasonal business with your vertically integrated business, scale is important, obviously, and, and you need year-round supply. This, this partnership, this, this diversity gives us the opportunity to do just that. So it really works quite well for us as a company, and I think it works quite well for our independent harvester partners. Thank you, Kerry. And I think you know we're down to our last uh, eight or nine minutes, um, so I want to you know turn back to the panel to do some wrap-up remarks. Um, you know, this week's Economist Ocean Summit has had has many senior business, government, and civil society leaders and decision makers are are in attendance. So each of you, in brief, what would be your key two or three take-home messages on sustaining the world's fisheries that you'd like to share with our attendees? Please do it in about two minutes. Thank you. Starting uh, Maria. Well, I would say uh, that uh, for this century, with all these great, amazing achievements, innovation, technology, whatever, uh, we uh, there are solutions for this big challenge. And I think that uh, we have to focus on partnerships because nobody is strong enough to solve the problem by himself or herself. So in my opinion, in the 21st century, partnership is the new leadership and the partnership means that we have joined forces the public authorities the political decision makers the markets the consumers the NGOs everybody in order to how can I say to to, to give the nature back what it deserves this is all for well said. Thank you, Maria. Jane, what, what would your closing messages? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, first of all, we have to restore this complex network of relationships between nature and humanity. And, and I think, Maria, you said it so beautifully about in, it making sure that nature and climate, it all comes together. And, and that's why at Walmart, we set the goals to become a regenerative company. And I think it's critical everybody takes into account 
all stakeholders involved and think about the role they can play and, and how you can add value to each, each, each stakeholder on the journey. Every company's journey will look different, but we're, you know, if we align on that common North Star, we can really make progress together. Um, we have to make the process as simple and straightforward uh, as we possibly can. And I think about it in three ways. Firstly, you know, look at our own business. So at Walmart, we look at our direct sourcing, what we can influence in our own brands. Um, secondly, how do we work with our suppliers and our partners to come on this journey with us? We, we, we leverage something called Project Gigaton to, to, to bring them on that journey and help everybody move towards the same goal. And then finally, how do we build that enabling environment and capacity to accelerate the systemic change? And that's where the philanthropy and the work that I mentioned that the Walmart Foundation is doing with other key partners plays a critical role. And just finally, none of us can do it on their own. We need the, the urgency of climate action needs all of us with a hands on deck approaches, you know, it's businesses, government, civil society. And if we all head in that right direction, I feel really optimistic we can make substantial progress. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Rupert? Okay, uh, we, we have no choice. We simply have to end overfishing. Uh, and despite the enormity of the challenge, I too remain optimistic. I think everybody's agreed there's, there's no silver bullet. We need to work better together, but we can resolve this. Uh, and to me, that's back to the political leadership. We have the sustainable development goals, uh, Agenda 2030. That really is humanity's best last chance to move us from a fundamentally unsustainable, inequitable system of production and consumption onto a more sustainable footing. The route map's there, we've just actually got to do it. Um, I think the market has to stay firm. Uh, the market has been a phenomenal driver uh, for sustainable fishing, rewarding those fishers who are doing the right thing. They must hold firm and maintain credible assurance in their procurement policies that they are buying fish and seafood from sustainable sources. And then ultimately, all of us, everybody uh, joining us today at the Economist event, we have individual responsibility, the choices we make, the way we lead our lives. So again, I'd urge those who decide to eat uh, seafood as a, as a source of protein, ask where it's come from. Is it sustainable? And if you don't get that assurance, don't buy it. Simple as that. Thank you very much, Rupert and Kerry. Yeah, not a whole lot I can add there. I think it's been well covered. I, I, I do think we should acknowledge certainly and celebrate the successes that we are having. There are many examples of fisheries that are well managed uh, globally. They've curbed overfishing, they've recovered. Uh, I've spoken to a couple of examples. Others can speak to those. We should look at those and, and how they've become successful and what's required to ensure that's transferable uh, elsewhere. I, I use the Canadian example. I, I mean, I, I'm part of the panel, so I'll, I'll put a plug in for Canada on this one. I mean, how far we've come, uh, you know, Know, from the iconic collapse uh, of the 80s and 90s, uh, the impetus behind uh, the creation of the MSC in part uh, was uh, out of the collapse, you know, Unilever and WWF coming together out of the collapse in part of, of the Grand Banks cod stocks. Uh, we've gone from that situation to about 80% of Canadian fisheries by value now are MSC certified. We still have issues. We still have challenges. There, there are things to address. But that's a positive development. There are other positive developments out there. We've talked about the developing world challenges and what we need to do there. Further investment, further work, further governance re required there. The last point I think I probably mentioned is, you know, uh, and maybe not talked about enough, areas right now here, I'll use Canada again as an example, where we have stocks that have not yet recovered. It's not driven by overfishing. The, the, the collapse was driven by overfishing back in the 70s and 80s, uh, in, in 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, but the recovery is, is being constrained by climate change, by, by environmental shift. And that, that's something that's not, I don't know if it's commonly talked about or if it's commonly discussed, but it's, uh, there's, a, there's an impression sometimes, well, then if you just curb fishing, stocks will recover. Well, we have many examples here where fishing is at very low level. Fishing mortality is almost non-existent and the stocks haven't recovered because there are other factors at play. And that's a bigger macro global climate change discussion and dialogue that we're having. Uh, but that has to be part of that dialogue as well. So I think that's important. And my last point, go out, as Rupert said, go out and source sustainable seafood. The market driver works. Um, uh, we're certainly a, a huge supporter of this and, uh, and we'll continue to move down that road. And uh, it's the best thing we can, uh, we can do to advance sustainable fisheries right now in, in, in many ways. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, everyone. Definitely hearing the key messages. It's about bringing much more harmony between people and nature. It's about everybody on board to solve these issues. And of course, the recurring overarching theme of climate change we're, we're hearing again and again. So 
I want to thank you all, Maria, Jane, Rupert, Carrie, for uh, sharing your valuable insights across this very broad, complex suite of challenges pertaining to overcoming overfishing. Um, I hope our audience can take home some of your key messages and advice and apply some of these in their own work as, as we all work together to sustain uh, the global ocean commons. So thanks again, everyone, for joining this session uh, at the Economist World Ocean Summit 2022. Thank you.